Albert Ottoman hook blade has two parts, you see. You see. What's up, everybody? I'm the hook. And I'm the blade. And together we're, you know. Welcome to the Hook Hook Blade Blade, a <laughs> podcast about all things uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Because, <laughs> you know, it's... The most anticipated Assassin's Creed <laughs> game of the year. I, I don't know about you, but I think that Ghost of Tsushima is what Assassin's Creed should be right now. <laughs> just, a, just a hot take from your boy, Lawson. Yeah, I've never heard that opinion before. No, it's a very... Uh, I'm I'm very original. Um, Tim, look, I want you to cast your memory back to a different, more innocent time, okay? Okay. We were recording episode one of this very podcast, Valhalla, details, thoughts, and theories. Information about Assassin's Creed Valhalla was just beginning to come out. Mm-hmm. I want you to, to, to put yourself in the headspace you were in then. Okay. What were you, what were you thinking, feeling, what were you hoping... In regards to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, what did your imagined version of the game look like? Um, well, it was really like revitalizing my interest in the series, and agreed. The end result was going to be something that's going to like get me back in it for at least a while, you know. Because you've always wanted, you've always wanted a medieval setting. Yeah, I mean, since the first game. Yeah, I, I've always wanted to go back there, and they they just teased me with the prologue in Unity. Uh huh. So and like the Rift missions in Unity, yeah. where where you be are able to be in medieval France, like mm-hmm. that setting has always just really made me happy. <laughs> right. So we're getting this information. We know that like okay, Ashraf is back, <laughs> Darby is back. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, it it really seemed like it really seemed like things were. Like, coming back to normal, I guess, Uh, because even though um, Ashraf isn't... (laughs) Even though Ashraf... We'll we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. (laughs) Even though Ashraf isn't behind every, like, my favorite games of the series, he always represented someone with a lot of passion. Yeah. With, especially Darby, because Darby has written my favorite game of the series. Yeah. So Darby coming back to me, I felt was going to breathe like a, like a classic air into the series you know because we've had such a departure in the last couple games i still think there's hope but uh, i don't know about you it's looking kind of bleak no i yeah i mean well the first the leaks came out yeah so (laughs) before we get too deep into this um a couple notes at the top of the show for you guys First thing, I'm in a different environment than I usually am, uh, so forgive any audio quality yeah, changes that may be a part of that. Also, Tim, would you believe me if I told you I'm still sick? No. <laughs> well, I'm not. I just wanted to see if you'd believe me. <laughs> five, five, four episodes later. M- many weeks, too, between yeah. <laughs> the last episode. Um, and then I do think that we would be remiss to not bring up and... and touch on like what's actually going on at ubisoft because i do think that we're in this really weird sort of interesting moment where at one time you have ubisoft doing this big old balls out press conference ubisoft forward here's everything that's happening at ubisoft and then it's actual absolute chaos behind the scenes (laughs) of executives being fired eve is like the CEO of Ubisoft, Yves Guillemot, is really, it seems like he's trying to contain the situation. Yeah. Um, trying to actually make some positive changes. Um, I know that one guy who is essentially the chief creative officer at Ubisoft, the the main dude who, you know, with a word, he could green light or cancel any video game that Ubisoft was developing. He was at the center of a number of allegations. Everyone thought he was untouchable. He's gone now. So, right. There are some good things happening, but if, for those of you who don't know, which I, I can't imagine there are many listening to this podcast who don't know what's been going on the last few weeks, um, we actually took a bit of a hiatus because it was just, it was really hard to feel excited and interested in Assassin's Creed at a time when a lot of the people involved with it, we were starting to find out, were doing some really scummy things. Yeah, and even people that we kind of admired. Uh, yeah, so people that we've bumming. had conversations with in some cases, people that we like are tangentially close to. Yeah, you know, it's been kind of a really, you know, every I think every community is starting to go through things like this. I, I just found out that apparently there's a massive 
like abuse scandal going on in the world of competitive Smash Brothers. Really, <laughs> it's no no one is safe. No, no one is safe. Not in the even world. not even the Smash Brothers. Bro. Not even the Smash Brothers are safe. <laughs> so yeah, it's been a little bit of a you could call it a me to be soft. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's been very bittersweet because on the one hand it's good that these things are coming out. But, Absolutely, uh, and positive and it, change is possible yes. because of the the bravery of a lot of these people speaking out about these issues. Yeah, because otherwise it just would have gone unchecked, and I think it's nice to see everyone kind of being unified in support. And it just sucks that these people who we thought we kind of knew a little bit, you know, yeah, uh, turned out different than we thought. Um, yeah. So I, I just hope for the most positive of, of change from here on. Yep. Um, if any of you are curious about some of this stuff, um, there's a great series of Twitter threads that have been compiled by, uh, I, I don't know if he's a journalist. I, I think he is though, in terms of gaming, but at Denny, the villain on Twitter, he compiles a lot of these, um, <clears throat> allegations, accusations, and the stories therein. Um, so give that a look if you're curious about all of this stuff, but, uh, yeah, it, it definitely casts a shadow over, the things that we're about to be talking about. 100%. With that in mind, uh, yes, chronologically, the first taste we got of Valhalla was a couple of leaks, a couple of leaked clips right. that were allegedly like basically alpha gameplay, if not pre-alpha. They were looking pretty rough. Yeah, that that for the first leak I saw was this was the hat was the half hour one, the yeah. one that got all the press. And it was the um, same mission being played in that leak uh, that is being played in the official UB Forward demo, too. Yeah. And so that was the first one that I saw. And then I admittedly was not too thrilled with it. But I, I yeah. tried. I kept, a, I, kept some, I kept some optimism because UB mm-hmm. Forward is right around the corner. Mm-hmm. And just before UB Forward, there was, that other, there was this other like mission that was leaked. Yeah, it was like uh, a nine-minute video. Yeah it, was, yeah, it was like seven or nine minutes and... It was Lady Eivor fighting some, like, witch boss thing. Yeah. And I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so le- here's one thing that you just made me think about that I'm not sure we've discussed at all before. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I really noticed something that Fizz, Philippe, the uh, the quest director, he's the one sort of narrating the UB Forward Valhalla demo, mm-hmm. and he talks about a, 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 a fight that you have with this supernatural mini boss situation. And he explains that there's an explanation for why you're seeing the weird shit you're seeing as Eivor. It's because you've been drugged. So the only official bit of like supernatural mythical kind of experience that we've seen, there's technically a completely logical grounded explanation for. So, but and now that- I'm wondering, the, the fact that they drew attention to that, that feels deliberate to me. Like, they want us to tell us, hey, this actually is going to be pretty grounded, regardless of what you've seen. But then you look at that video of fighting a witch boss, and you're like, yeah. I think this is just a dead-ass witch that we're fighting right, right now. Well, this is just I mean, a real witch. How often is Eivor going to be drugged? I mean, when, when she yeah. fights the witch or the giant wolf, yeah, you know, or has to hack and slash a boss a hundred times. Yeah, and even if they try to go the route of like, oh, well, actually, this weird thing you're seeing is like a first civilization shenanigans, like, that's better than nothing, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't quite hold up to a whole lot of scrutiny, I don't think. But I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, I know that you personally are not a big fan of the mythological stuff, right? No, I mean, I'm... I guess I'm into it if it's like a contained DLC type deal. Yeah. But when it bleeds into the actual game, I mean... Because I always prefer the more the more grounded entries. So, mm-hmm. um, like it's just like the 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 wackiest AC one god is at the very end of the game, and even still, you're just fighting like multiple people. You're not fighting big monsters or anything. Right, and it was surprising too. It was like, a moment. Yes. It was memorable. Now it's like you know you've got Alexios or Cassandra, and you're just. Oh, I found a Cyclops. Yeah, well, even outside of that, though, I mean, you have, like, the main tool that you carry around in that game is in itself kind of, like, supernatural. Essentially described as a first first civilization artifact. Right. And that's about it. They can kind of hand wave anything. They can kind of say, okay, well, 
This is first Civ, so don't ask any questions about it. Yeah, it's definitely become kind of like a MacGuffin. I mean, yeah. In some ways it always was, but I think they're now just sort of... There are many devices in Assassin's Creed that sort of make up its internal mythology that at one point were consistent with each other and made sense, and now they've changed so often to accommodate different directions that... It's kind of hard to tell, uh, you know, everything from the first civilization stuff to the actual technology, the animus, the things that power the Assassin's Creed universe. It's a lot more vague and slippery than it used to be. Right. But what were your impressions of the gameplay? You know, do you feel like because I I noticed that I do think that the UB forward demo, the gameplay looks better cleaner more polished than it did in the leak the leak looked pretty rough yeah so i believe uh, when people say that it was unfinished stuff yeah i mean when i first saw the leak uh i my uh, first third, half hour one my main criticism was like wow this looks really rough i mean the combat looked terrible it looked really awkward yeah and so that definitely was better in the official uh gameplay i will say though the official gameplay didn't do anything to make me more excited for any of it. Yeah. Um, I ended up, I, I kind of just was really underwhelmed and disappointed um, overall. I think I was surprised at how similar it really did look fe- and feel to what we've just had with Origins and Odyssey. I, like, I knew it was going to be iterative in that way. I knew it was going to be based on the same engine and the same technology. But the actual experience of the gameplay looks so similar even with the fresh coat of paint, the new looking world, the you know the dingier aesthetic, the new user interface elements of design, stuff like that, it still looks very much the same. Yeah, I mean, the way that it was described originally before we had saw very much is that like the combat was crunchy and weighty. And yeah. It doesn't quite look that way. And I know people who have played it have have attested to that, but it still just looks very like uh, arcade like and. Then you have navigation, which essentially is the same. And there might be more focus on navigation. It doesn't mean that the, the system itself is going to be very fun. And yeah, I think we have... can go ahead and just dash any expectations we had of this being like a good parkour game. That's out yeah, the window. for certain, yeah. Which is fine. I mean, again, like we're talking about 9th century England. I think we probably in our hearts knew it was not going to be great parkour. It does, in some of the clips, look better to me than odyssey uh parkour but i mean the system is the same the system is unchanged the animations the actual and i think the fact that there are going to be parkour puzzles throughout the universe that you know that's better than nothing i like having those i guess yeah but uh, you know how challenging those puzzles are those puzzles going to be able to be with such a uh easy system yeah i don't know that's what I'm, i'm sort of curious about I liked what they talked about in the forward demo of, you know, you see a house out and about, it's got a chest in it, and then there's kind of a puzzle you'll have to figure out to get access to that chest. Right. That's a lot more interesting to me than, like, you know, throwing a chest behind a handful of guards or just having oh, them be yeah. completely out in the open. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I saw it when one of the videos, like, you had to, like, break a well and climb down the well and find the key for it. Yeah. Like, that kind of stuff is interesting, and it'll make it more um, involving than just yeah. running around and opening chests. The more I have to think about the game, the better. Yeah, so it's not so mindless. Exactly. And, all, and also, pe- that and that paired with the idea that all, the, all your gear is unique, and you're not going to find, like, ten versions of the same weapon... It's going to make me want to go and find those chests more because I might get a sword that's going to be that's better than the one I have. Not yeah. by just a couple points, but it will be more unique and something that I might want to carry with me forever. Yeah, my main takeaway from all this information, I'm definitely, as you said, I'm not as excited as I was before. I think that before we knew what it really looked like to play this game, it was really easy to run wild in your head with like... Absolutely. The the kinds of things they were saying about it. You know, they talk about, okay, well, the world is more handcrafted. It's not as copy-paste. It's not as arbitrary as these last couple games. That's and awesome. It, and it, it, it might yeah. still be. It does It does definitely seem like there's a lot more There's a lot more density to the map. But you can still hear that and think, oh, 
more handcrafted world, this is just going to be 10 times better. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, the, the, the finished, not finished product, but what we've seen so far definitely doesn't, that definitely doesn't live up to what my expectations were in my head. But I, you know, I do have to, I will say to give it credit, it does look more dense than the, than the previous games. And we are all like, we're all victims of hype. A lot of the time. Yeah. I mean, I take the responsibility for my own expectations in some regard. Like, I I can't fault the game for not living up to the perfect game I might have imagined five episodes ago on this podcast. But I do think that I, from what we've seen, I have a reasonable expectation, I think, that as far as what I look for in an Assassin's Creed game, this is going to be better than Origins and Odyssey were. For me yeah and and while i agree with that yeah. I, I i do think it doesn't quite get there for me in terms of like like i i just i'm not really on the hype train anymore yeah and it you know it sucks to say that i i, I guess but um because I, I you're right because i definitely had a certain expectation in my head but at the same time just based off of what we were hearing and it was very easy for that to sound pleasant outside of the current like engine and systems that odyssey and origins ran on yeah, but yeah. Put the things they that, talk about that sounded really interesting and exciting. Right, like put in that framework though, because because we know that you know uh, combat isn't going to necessarily be like back to the basics like it was. Which I'm not it's, even sure I want it to be. I just want sure. the design of the game to be a lot less combat forward. That's another thing I enjoy about the demo though, is that we do get finally a look at what the hidden blade implementation is and. Having the the timer thing, like the little timed hit, is this is like far and away much better than the Origins Odyssey implementation. Yeah, because it's a it's a good compromise between the the two. It's crazy they didn't show in the demo what you can really do if you if you go for stealth because you know in the demo you have this fight with Rued, the Viking dude, and you just he's a he's he's a classic Origins Odyssey hit sponge enemy. And mm-hmm. you just wail at him for, you know, ever. And then he dies. But we saw in one of the YouTuber videos later, you can stealth up to him, you know, get up at a high point, like on that sort of rope above the fight mm-hmm. area, and air assassinate him and clear half his health bar. Yeah, no, for, yeah, so that definitely, like, incentivizes you to do stealth. More, it incentivizes which... you to be to do stealth by a lot. Yeah, which and there that, wasn't so much of that before. That's fantastic. I think that I've always had this... It's. It's barely a conspiracy theory because it's pretty much truth that the reason these past couple of games would be so combat forward is because combat is really easy to break down into a game of stats of having all these different statistics that make it so the better gear you have and the higher level you are, the more frictionless your combat experience is going to be. That makes it really easy to RPGify that system which makes it really easy to monetize the game because someone who wants to have a, a powerful badass armor set but doesn't want to grind, doesn't want to go looting a bunch of places to find that powerful armor might be inclined to just buy it. Right. Stealth is entirely skill based, right? Not that combat isn't skill based, but you can offset. I mean, it's it's a numbers game, really. Well, yeah, I mean, well, I, I would even say that that is part of why the combat become like or or rather the gear in those games become so redundant because yeah. you're constantly just trying to find like these these very minuscule numbers that just can benefit exactly. you in a couple in a couple stats and managing know? like a loadout build sort of situation to to maximize the, the yeah i mean yeah there's not much fun about that exactly it's not a a style of gameplay that i enjoy because you know, in Odyssey, the stealth game is pretty much neutered. It's just, it's not possible because they want to force you into those instances of having to take on a higher level enemy and make it so that you have to fight them because that will encourage you to focus on your gear and that will encourage you to spend money. That's that's how it works, I think. Well, and that also uh, kind of hinders you from wanting to explore because it's like, well, what's the point if I'm just going to have to like fight a bunch of guys that are going to kill me one hit? Yeah. And then, but in this game, apparently, you're going to be able to explore new places because it doesn't restrict you to do so. Now, is it going to be a good idea? Maybe not. But the, just having that opportunity 
I do appreciate. Absolutely. Another thing I noticed, um, and I talked to you about this briefly, and I tweeted about this a little bit, is I, I pay a lot of attention in Assassin's Creed games to the UI design. And early on w- with that leak, I noticed that the approach that they're taking to the way that the user interface looks... I feel like to me it says a lot about the game, whether it is intending to say a lot or not. They've pretty much dropped any pretense that what you're interacting with is like Animus software. Typically, in pretty much every past game, including Origins and Odyssey, the reason your your user interface looks modern is because you are, you know, diegetically in the world of the game, you are playing an Animus interface that is showing you these memories, which means that your menu screens, your HUD items, they look like, you know, a modern software interface. They have sans serif fonts and clean geometric shapes, right? Yeah, at, at first I didn't know what you were talking about, and then I got a I got a better look at it, and I totally see what you were saying uh, and, in terms of just kind of how generic it looks now. Yeah, the new the UI for Valhalla... It drops that pretense, and in that in, in and in that way, it becomes very generic fantasy game looking. Right. They use fonts that are supposed to evoke the time period more than they would evoke a VR interface HUD. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, it it starts to look more like a Witcher game purely on a UI level than an Assassin's Creed game, and that's really interesting to me. I also just a moment ago, before we started recording, saw a glimpse of what the memory corridor looks like. Have you seen it? I haven't. It's sort of an Aurora Borealis design, which they've used that iconography pretty heavily. And that's, it's cool, it's beautiful. But fascinatingly to me, it doesn't look like a computer. Like, you don't have any, like, classic right. animus touches of, you know, bits of data flying about or a grid on the floor. Like, things that would make it look like you're in a computer. Instead, it looks like you're in an endless void with an aurora borealis and stars. Interesting. Even like the Origins memory corridor had a lot more of like a digital feel to it. This has yeah. So like it's back, but it isn't <laughs> like the right. corridor. And I mean, I think it is back in the sense that I mean, I'm glad I can just run around in the loading screen now. That's fantastic. And if I can interrogate someone I assassinate, that's cool too. Yeah. We like those things. Those things we associate with the best Assassin's Creed games. And they're often missing from the ones that don't feel as adherent to the Assassin's Creed ethos. They're back. That's good. But it is part of that whole UI thing of it. It doesn't look like it's even trying to be an Assassin's Creed animus looking sort of experience. Yeah, for sure. I I would be interested, like, maybe, I don't know, is it a different animus? Because it used to follow that sort of a, you know, of a logic where... Yeah, I mean, as it would update, it would update with the Animus, correct? It would, yeah, it would. So, I don't... Yeah, I mean, like, so, having you point out to me, it does look... Like, obviously, it looks nice, but in comparison to other UIs previously, I definitely prefer those. Because it immerses you more, I think, into, like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm in the Animus. But now it just kind of looks like you're, you're just playing any random RPG. And there's something to be said for that. Like, oh, well, we don't want people to feel immersed in the animus. We want them to feel immersed in the world. And that's right. I would I would understand that. I'm just curious about it. And I don't think, obviously, there's going to be an animus. Obviously, you're in an animus when you play this game. But maybe this is just one of those steps that they take on the, on the line, on the path towards foregoing those modern day elements in the future. I feel like that's a possibility. Right, and well, also speaking of like the modern day elements, um, there is an interesting way that they're handling modern day in this game, which, yeah. I, which I honestly don't know if I like. Um, I'm tentatively very cool with it, and <clears throat> yeah, like I have faith, like in in the way Darby would bring it up, but yeah. For, I don't know if I love the idea. If you don't know, what we're talking about is essentially something called animus anomalies. So while you are running around in the game. Uh, you will find moments that essentially bring Layla into your world and you will, as Layla, complete parkour puzzles and things of that nature. Uh, So it's a way of progressing the modern day story without you having to leave the Animus. And the reason I'm fascinated by this is two things. One is 
any excuse to give us more modern day story for the development resources is good. I feel like modern day falls by the wayside often because it requires there to be this, you know, environment that's separate, that's different. And as the designers of the game, they don't want to interrupt your experience with a, a modern day interlude, which right. I respect. But at the same time for me playing those older games, I never felt like it was an interruption. I always felt like it was a reward. I would play more of a game, even like unity so that I could get that next bit of modern day content because for a lot of these games, that's where the mystery was. That's where the intrigue was, is figuring yeah. out what's going on in the modern day. I would say the last time that modern days really impressed me and never, like, for instance, in, to go off of what you're saying, I never felt interrupted by Syndicate's modern day because it was so good. Right. Like, I mean, they were short always, scenes. Right. And they yeah, didn't get in the like, way too much. Like, it's not like they were too momentum shattering because they were very short most of the time. Yeah. And and also them not being gameplay instances did not have, like, it didn't make you have to all of a sudden be like, okay, I guess I'm playing as Desmond now or whoever. So, um, and I get it because going back through, I played a little bit of Assassin's Creed 3 recently and I can totally get why someone playing that game would be like, oh, why do I have to do this Desmond shit? I just want to be in the past. Because there's a lot yeah. of it. It's like there are definitely are people like that for sure. And and that wasn't my take, but I understood why someone felt that way. Now we're getting to a place where like they're trying to every game they shift their approach to try and please everyone. And you know, interestingly, the past couple games we've gotten more modern day than in years, but it's really shitty regardless. Like yeah, it's just I mean, bad and uninteresting, and I don't care about Layla at all. And it doesn't. And I think what proves to I guess, like, at least you and me, that modern day doesn't necessarily need to be playable to be good is Syndicate. Yes. Like, it, there's no playable aspect to it, and it's one of my favorite iterations of it. And I, I don't if know if that's a favorite. popular opinion, but I'm right there with you, that the nine minutes of cutscenes that make up Syndicate's modern day, they moved the story forward so much more than anything in the last, like, five games combined. Yeah. And they even had time for some emotional payoff. Like that scene where Sean is like lamenting how he treated Desmond and that, you know, he, yeah. you know, that like actually worked that that mattered. No, yeah, it was like one of my favorite scenes in the whole thing yeah. is, is because it's like, wow, you're referencing old characters finally, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like that stuff got so halted yeah. with uh, Black Flag yeah. and Unity. Yeah. Um, and just seeing, because it's not about just seeing the old characters, because we saw the old characters in Black Flag a little bit, but it's also about like what they do and what they say, and I think Syndicate nailed it. And so if that, from and I, I know we're, I don't want to get too in the weeds about just Syndicate's modern day, but if the modern day was permanently like that, I wouldn't have a problem with it. These animus anomalies, what I'm look, why I'm looking forward to them is because the, knowing that they exist is going to make exploration more engaging for me because something I do care deeply about as an Assassin's Creed fan is what's happening in the modern day story and knowing that I can come across bits and pieces of it in the in the overworld of the game in the main game that's like that's awesome and in, in Syndicate too when you figured when you found the Helix Rift if you just found it and no one told you where it was because it wasn't something that the game led you to you had to find it your yourself right that was, was yeah. super rewarding to find this huge piece of content that the game wasn't actively dragging you to right and i think if they do it kind of this way it'd be really nice and i also think if like the secrets or the mysteries are actually secrets and mysteries that you come across <laughs> and they're not and, and they're not an icon on your map yeah That'd be so much more rewarding. That is going to be well. nice. I did have to chuckle a little bit. I think I, you know, may have mentioned this to you. Like, I, I just remember seeing a screenshot of the, like, secrets and mysteries. Like, every region essentially has a, a progress bar for wealth, secrets, and mysteries. And it just feels like such a Ubisoft thing to be like, <laughs> our game has a lot of mysteries and secrets in it. Here's your fucking mystery and secret <laughs> progress bar. <laughs> Make sure you find yeah. all those mysteries and secrets before you stop playing the game. Yeah. You wouldn't want to miss yeah, any cool mysteries or secrets. Yeah, I mean, are they really secretive if you tell me where they are? <laughs> and, tell me to, and make sure that I do them. If you're like, like, 
Yeah. If I can look at a region and go, hmm, I've found 75% of the secrets. <laughs> I, I do think um, that in that second, the, the witch battle or whatever, because once, once you, once you uh, vanquish her, yeah. it gives you a little progress bar. And it's like, there, there goes one mystery in the East Anglia <laughs> era. Like, oh, nice. Congrats. You did a mystery. Glad I could solve that one. Imagine if there were secrets and mysteries in the game that were not helpfully delineated as secrets and mysteries. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like it's almost like if they labeled a side quest fun. <laughs> Here's where the this is the fun part <laughs> of the game. <laughs> Click here for fun. <laughs> God, I love Ubisoft, dude. They're so, they are just so, they're trying so hard all the time. Click here for enjoyment. <laughs> they they just, they cannot let you miss anything. That's no, they the can't thing. let you miss any content. We yeah. talk about when you look at these like Rockstar games, Red Dead Redemption 2. And keep in mind, Red Dead Redemption 2, GTA 5 together have probably sold more copies than the Holy Bible. I don't know if I talked about this on the podcast already because I'm starting to think that I have the whole idea that like in in a rock star game you can pass something on the side of the road and it'll it, you'll know that if you talk to this person or you do this thing it'll it'll give you a story it'll lead you somewhere interesting and you can just not do it. God forbid you miss you know like a side quest and don't finish it you know or or even still like. Like you, like you, like you're mentioning in Rockstar games, like in Red Dead Redemption Two, at least from what I'm aware of, like there are people who you just might never ever run into on the on the side of the road if you're mm-hmm. if you don't go that way. And spoiler alert for Red Dead Redemption Two: <laughs> at the end of the game, your character dies <laughs> and they yeah, stay which, dead. Which I'm so surprised that they haven't done in. Assassin's Creed yet because they throw away the protagonist of that game after that game anyway. Oh yeah, you're never gonna see why, these why not just again. Yeah, why not just have like a self sacrifice type deal? I'm just kind of interested why that hasn't, hasn't happened. Yet. Yeah. Anyway, there are definitely like it's not like there aren't parts of it that I see and I'm like, wow, that looks like no fun at all. It definitely looks like an enjoyable game. Yeah. The the problem for me though is I have to reconcile with one. It's nothing like I I want Assassin's Creed to be, and it's probably never going to be again. Until we're 30. Right. But at the same time, I can't even enjoy it. I can't say, okay, well, I'm just going to close my eyes and imagine I'm playing The Witcher or play this. Because those games do what this game is trying to do, most likely, better than those games. And obviously, like, Darby is probably more talented writer than most of, most of them. But when it comes down to gameplay experience, it will always be the mediocre version of those games it's trying to emulate. Because they're still holding on a certain iconography from the series... To get people like you and me interested. Yeah. But they don't utilize it enough to get us like very happy about it. But they also they only hold on to it just a tad so that they can still call it Assassin's Creed, just so that they can still market it as that and not have to mm-hmm. worry about building a new another IP. I'm I'm ready to love this game. I'm open to loving this game. Because the truth is my standards are very low. <laughs> I mean, they've really whittled me down to the point where like <laughs> I should not be in a point I should not be in a position where seeing an assassin makes me excited, right? Yeah, just a guy in robes. Just a guy in robes. Oh my god. It's an assassin. <laughs> because wow. again, for the majority of this game's series existence, you couldn't look at a frame of one of those games without seeing an assassin, right? right. Why is that exciting to me? Well, it's cuz I've been beaten down and I just I'll take whatever they'll give me at this point. So for me, I'm like, all right, it's it's the same kind of it's the same kind of design philosophy as Origins and Odyssey. I'm not in love with it. I want parkour to be great. I want stealth to be the focus. I want the story to be awesome. And again, un- unless one of those components is fundamentally broken. I will probably like the game because if you look at the games in Assassin's Creed history that I hate the most, they are the ones where one or more of those components is fundamentally broken. Unity, AC3, they have gameplay I and AC3 stories. I thought AC3 was your favorite. 
They have gameplay and stories that are fundamentally broken. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? <laughs> you said you thought AC3 was my favorite? Yeah, go, go fuck yourself, <laughs> Timothy. Of course it's not. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, for the listeners, <laughs> I fucking hate Assassin's Creed Three. I think I think you must have mentioned it before. There's no I'm way you could sure go. Sure, I mentioned mention it before. It. And if anyone watches my story forward videos, um, the one on Odyssey, I mentioned that I hate Assassin's Creed Three, and I really laughed my ass off because one of the commenters was like, um, "I really enjoyed this video, even though you have stupid and wrong opinions, like thinking that Syndicate is good and AC Three is bad." <laughs> I mean, compared to AC Three, Syndicate is AC Two. <laughs> Thank you. I agree <laughs> because I just started replaying AC3 recently, the remastered one, and God, does it just chug ass to play. <laughs> I have no idea. How does a game that came out, I know I tweeted this, but yeah, how does a game that came out seven years ago, eight years ago, still feel like it has not been play tested once? <laughs> Even in a remastered Even the version. remastered version. They did it again years later. And it still feels like no one play tested it. If if AC Unity is a seamless game, as the meme goes, that it's seamless, AC3 is downright seamful. <laughs> it is so many seams in that game. <laughs> There's a loading screen every time you breathe in Assassin's Creed 3. <laughs> it's like pause, loading the next breath that your character takes. <laughs> Sorry. Even switching a weapon pauses the game. I couldn't get through to the point where you actually are an assassin on this playthrough. That, yeah, I well, it up. comes in like sequence seven. Yeah, doesn't it's it? halfway through the game that you become an assassin, which is its own problem. But hey, you know, <laughs> this isn't episode six shitting on AC3. This is Valhalla <laughs> gameplay reactions. We got important <laughs> stuff to talk about, like how um, social stealth is back. Oh, yeah, I guess. But. The interesting thing about that is is that these detection zones or the restricted areas aren't automatic detections. Yes. So like the so the hooding cloak is like, hey, you could just kind of seem suspicious, but you're not detected immediately, and you can get to a blend spot or what have yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, I dig it. It's interesting though, because the uh, the official gameplay shows like ten seconds of it, <laughs> and then yeah. it's back to other things. But a lot of the YouTubers who have been playing it have shown off shown it off and. It is. It also is nice that, it's, that you can toggle it, because in Syndicate you could you'd have to crouch to initiate it. Yeah. But in this game, you can just. I guess you could always have your hood and cloak on it as it as it seems. Yeah, yeah. and that's cool because I like that and it's good. Yeah. Do I just it's, have a stroke? It sucks that we have to. Huh? Did I just have a stroke? Maybe. I said that's cool because I like that and it's good. <laughs> <laughs> can you make Can you make that your ringtone? <laughs> no. Um. My ringtone is is actually Darby McDevitt whispering sweet nothings into my phone. Uh, there you go. Yeah, and it just sucks that we have to congratulate them for putting a hood in the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're such simps for Assassin's Creed, dude. They give us any morsel of something we like, and we're just like, oh, thank you. Next, we're going to see a smoke bomb, and I'm going to well, fucking... You're going to jizz. We're in... I'm going <laughs> to... We're in... An Assassin's Creed desert since 2015. I know. We're just looking for an oasis. Uh, Origins is a literal desert. And ever since then, we've been in an actual desert. And and seeing a hood is like is like Darby himself dropped a tiny bit of water on our tongues. Just a little drop. <laughs> just a little. Darby himself pissed in our face. <laughs> Here's a hood. And we, and we thanked him for it. Yeah. Next, <laughs> I'm going to see it. Next, I'm going to see some throwing knives. <laughs> Well, okay, you'll have I'm to settle for my mind. axes. Yeah, I guess. It's like, how do I feel about the fact that you can just throw as many axes as you want? They're not a consumable. Have you seen that there's a hunger system in this game? It, I, I saw in the demo that you had. They, it said that you had to hunt and stuff to survive. That there are rations. Upgrade your equipment. And you'll have to go. Essentially, your health won't restore automatically. So if you get really low on health, right. you have to eat food. Right, yeah, because that was yeah, that was mentioned in the official one, I, I think because you had to like Because in the hunt world of video games, everyone has always loved hunger systems. And having to hunt. And and having to hunt in Assassin's Creed games. People just when when you see that there's hunger and that you have to eat in a video game, people love that, right? <laughs> I, my favorite part of Minecraft is having to eat. Yeah. 
I mean, I look, I, I gotta admit though, I kind of think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think it could be stupid, but I, I like the idea that I have to go fucking hunt a deer or something and eat. I it, respect you know? the fact that hunting is now something you have to do because I am on a I've always been on a personal mission to avoid hunting as much as possible. And I feel like this is a choice they made specifically to fuck with me. Yeah, just you specifically. Just me. Just me specifically. Because I'll play every game and it'll say, here's your quest where we teach you how to hunt. And I'll say, I'll do this quest game, but know that I'm never doing this shit again if I can avoid it. Now I have to. But again, as, as I've said on this podcast, I'm a slut for fishing mini games. So if fishing yes, is and you good. Can, you can fish. I will fish all the time. That'll be my main source of nourishment, and I'll be okay with that. Yeah, it's just, it, it, it looks like it is fun. Well, someone also but not asked, fun in the way I want it our, to our buddy to rule, the head moderator of the Assassin's Creed subreddit, for which best friend of the show, I also moderate. Um, he did an AMA about his three hours of gameplay, and he described the hunting or he described the food system as annoying. <laughs> I take his word for that at the moment. Until I play the game, that's what I think it's gonna be. Well, I guess we're just gonna have they're gonna have to switch it to medicine instead. <laughs> I mean, that you got annoying craft. too sometimes having to refill your consumables. But I do think that it, it introduces an element of pacing, uh, where you're not just going like an Odyssey. You can just go fly from thing to thing and just fucking fuck up a fort and then recover your health and then yeah. fuck up Yeah, I, I always thought it was therapeutic to, like, to actually refill to your like, medicine, yeah. refill your throwing knives and, 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 and ammo and And the whole stuff. settlement like design that. philosophy of, like, you come back to it as your home base, that's entirely a pacing choice of breaking up the action by requiring you to do things that are a little more low-key and kind of give you the feeling that you are preparing for things and that is a very oh, yeah. rewarding and exciting yeah. gameplay sensation i mean since assassin's creed 2 also your main base being able to change it and upgrade it and making it look nicer and work better for you like that's a, that's like a classic assassin's creed thing so the fact that it's back and also like the thing that the game is focused around mm -hmm. is is definitely promising i think we've been on a journey of discovery with Assassin's Creed Valhalla that has taken us on an emotional roller coaster with very high highs and very low lows, which I would describe <laughs> as the gameplay leak. Of yeah. The time, you know, or, or seeing a, a boss fight with a witch. But at yeah. the same time, this is not Odyssey. And this isn't the hype cycle for Odyssey either. Because if we cast our minds back to 2018... We did not give a shit about Odyssey. At all, no, I, I did. I had. I didn't even watch the game. I play. actively did not participate in that cycle until pretty much the game came out. Yeah, I was. I was unhappy. I, and the thing is, too, is they're being very coy with the assassins and, or sorry, hidden ones and Templars, whatever they're going to order call of the it. ancients, uh, apparently. Yeah, they're, they're very coy with all that stuff, and apparently the game is brimming with it. I see none of it, but I, I guess that's on purpose. But I wouldn't I be surprised if we get about as much Assassin Templar involvement here, of course, by their other names, as we saw in something like Black Flag. Right, for sure. I I don't know why I just made this conclusion like the other day, I told you, but there is no way that you're not going to be able to uh, either romance a Templar or an Assassin in this game. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah, it is. It's going to happen. And we're going to come to a point, like we've talked about what we would consider the actual death of the franchise. And I think we've pretty much agreed that the moment you can create your own character and choose whether you're an assassin or a Templar is the moment that Assassin's Creed ceases to exist. Yeah, for sure. I mean, right now it's on life support in my eyes. Yeah. But the death, the, the official, I'm pulling the plug on it, is when that happens. Yeah, that's yeah. that's when we we make a tough call. We unplug the machine. And we, we say we say goodbye to mom. <laughs> we have a funeral. <laughs> That's when it's dead and buried. Um, so Ubisoft, if any of you are listening, first off, stop sexually assaulting people. But second, don't introduce, build a character 
or alignment choices with assassins and templars because that's that's when we all that's when we all leave we all go away i mean that also might happen in this game though you might be able to align with either of them it could happen yeah i feel like if you can align with like either dane or saxon that could be that would be fine but if i'm not if i can choose to help the templars that seems like a bad time i think darby knows that though like darby has said you know if there was going to be a templar game experience it wouldn't look like an Assassin's Creed game. It would be like an RTS or something where you're controlling units or something like that. Yeah. He said that mm-hmm. it would have to be a fundamentally different game because the design philosophy of Assassin's Creed is not consistent with what the Templar experience would look like. Yeah. And I think Rogue is a pretty great demonstration of that. The idea that you're playing as a Templar and you're just doing Assassin shit the whole time. Yeah. But hey. The fact that we're having this podcast and we're having this conversation about Valhalla, I think that is actually a sign that there's more to be excited about with this game than there has for the last couple. Because you and I have been friends for years and we've and we're friends because of Assassin's Creed. But it took this game to be announced for us to be like, let's start a podcast. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it helped that it was a, a global pandemic, so neither of us had anything better to do. Yeah, we had a lot of free time. But we said, we did say in episode one of the Hookblade podcast, and I might find a clip and put it here, but if I don't, I'll just paraphrase myself. What if the gameplay demo comes out and we hate it? <laughs> Which... Has happened with me. <laughs> the very least. And we said we would cancel the show if that happened, did we not? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we'd like to thank our listener. <laughs> we would like to thank all of our listener. Um, <laughs> White Wolf Whispers, it's been real. <laughs> thank you so much. Jacers Habs 18. Uh, you have kept the show alive. You, you've been uh, our, our biggest fans and our, our greatest supporters. And for that, we thank you. <laughs> And anyone else obviously listening to the podcast if you exist um no you're not thanked we actually don't thank you because you didn't leave any no. comments we're talking exactly. about the people who left comments and only them because they matter more than you so lesson learned start leaving comments if you want us to shout you out in the show yeah leave a comment and you know we'll leave a just... comment on this video telling us how mad you are that we didn't shout you out yeah and then we'll bring you on the next and episode then you can be a guest because we don't care anymore. <laughs> this is no. this is like when, you know, when a show gets canceled, so they just do whatever the hell they want in the last few episodes. We're just going to do whatever yeah, the hell like, we want. We're just going to invite, like, you know, if your mother or dad or brothers want to come on. Just we're going to do a full episode about Ghost of Tsushima just to fuck with you. <laughs> I, it's going to be difficult. I, I can't play it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about it like it's the AC game that comes out this year. We're going to be like, dude, I'm a big fan of Assassin's Assassin- Creed Ghost of Tsushima. <laughs> Assassin's Creed sequel that we deserve. The, 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 the real Assassin's Creed game that came out in 2020. Um, so yeah, as always, if you enjoyed this podcast... Don't like, don't comment. <laughs> do not, under any circumstances, it's interact with us. <laughs> under any circumstances. Don't follow me Don't on Twitter. Don't follow me on Twitter at Lawson underscore found. <laughs> this is the part where you say yours, Tim. Oh, um, but I, don't, but I don't want them to follow me. It's zero underscore region. <laughs> but specifically not to follow you there, right? Yeah, don't follow me. Um, <clears throat> but that's my handle. <laughs> uh, also, guys, um, we're sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. We're really sorry. <laughs> Will there be an episode seven of Hookblade? Maybe. We'll see. We don't know yet. Will it be next week? Probably not. (laughs) All right, guys. See you next week. (laughs) (laughs) See you next week. That excitement increases. I would hate for the gameplay to come around and then let's be like, oh. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, Hookblade but, podcast abruptly canceled after gameplay demo. <laughs> right. I mean, but yeah. I mean, 
I I'm pretty optimistic about it. I I think that gameplay was gonna is gonna knock our socks off.